Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, my name is Gaurav Arora. I'm a faculty of economics at IIIT Delhi and let's get started with the first lecture of spatial statistics and spatial econometrics. So we will begin with some information about how this course will be conducted. So the primary objective of this course is to provide a graduate level maturity in statistical analysis for students of engineering mathematics, statistics, earth sciences, economics and other quantitative social sciences. So at the outset, uh, we can see that this course will have wide applications. So you know, a wide uh, range uh, of students coming from different domains can take advantage from this course. I believe that statistical concepts are best understood with applications. So in this course, uh, we will strive to have, you know, in class, in class exercises which will be applied in nature. We will have weekly assignments that will help students apply the concepts that are going to be learnt during lecture hours on real world problems. And then there will be a lab component towards the end of this course, uh, which will provide hands on training on GIS software using ArcGIS as well as some uh, packages in R that have similar or even more advanced, uh, you know, uh, 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 applications. So, about the origins of spatial statistics. Spatial statistics is a relatively new science, perhaps the newest among the subdomains of statistics. There are several other subdomains of statistics, for example, there is biostatistics. Among these subdomains, spatial statistics seems to be the newest ones. The early applications in, of spatial statistics came from earth sciences, specifically in mining, where for, for coal ore estimation, that is the quality of coal available or any ore available inside the earth is fundamentally not visible to the statistician, the miner, the, the, the analyst that is out there to dig that or extract that coal. So what we can achieve at best is that we can d dig some holes at some locations on ground and, and we have to predict what is the, the pattern of quality underneath the ground from what we can observe from few points on, on top of the earth where we have dug. Similarly, you have problems of oil exploration, so oil search campaigns, uh, you know, done by petroleum industry have similar issues, you know, where should they send their next expedition, right? These are costly expeditions. So that's where statistics comes in. It tries to predict what would be the best optimal pathway in terms of extracting coal from ground or searching for oil. Um, more modern applications are, are of image processing. Therein, we will look at satellite image data. That's uh, one of the most popular, uh, you know, applications of spatial statistics. There is medical imagery, MRI, fMRI. That's where, that is also where spatial statistics is finding its use today. Uh, in crop yield ex uh, estimation for agricultural experiments, for insurance provision by, uh, for, uh, by business intelligence consulting firms, um, for conducting tiger census, you know, uh, by ec ecological and environmental scientists uh, is, is also finding its uh, use of uh, spatial statistics. Finally, for regional planning, uh, for example, uh, planning bus routes in a city, uh, planning a metro rain, uh, train, sorry, metro train uh, network, uh, you know, where to put the next route, you know, what should be the best, uh, you know, locations where, you know, most residents of a city can find connectivity will find applications of spatial statistics. So with that, you know, let's define formally what is uh, spatial statistics. So first of all, before we get to what is spatial statistics, we should understand what is statistics. Well, uh, statistics is a science of uncertainty. So statistics posits the, the observations that we see around us in the world as, as fundamentally random in nature, right? 
and and but you know in this fundamentally stochastic or random real world around us there is some order and statistics as a discipline as a science strives to de determine or identify order in disorder right so it takes a sequence of entities or sequence of events for example climate change right if we want to understand the pattern of drought so fundamentally statistics posits incidence of drought as a random event what do we see is some observations of drought in the past right so let's say a drought happens in the indo-gangetic plains once in every three years sometimes it happens within two years sometimes it happens after five in five year intervals right so Statistics would take the sequence of events that have been observed in the past and then try to discover some kind of order in the sense of what is the average frequency, the you know median frequency or similar type of moments between two different droughts and you know uh, 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 what kind of events precede this drought. Okay, So how can we predict the next drought? That's the basic uh, you know uh, 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 basic line of inquiry. Spatial statistics adds a new dimension of where to this uh, science of what and how in, in determining order in disorder. So it would then ask not only when will drought happen and how it will happen, how strong it will be uh, in terms of its intensity, it will also ask where will it happen exactly in space. So we bring in a new dimension of space. If you want a little bit more intuition, you can think of the dimension of time, you know. So time itself is a new dimension as far as, you know, uh, uh, you know, time series statistics is concerned. In time series, you have a time origin T0, then you have T1, which comes after T0, then T2, that comes after T1, and so on and so forth. It keeps going till infinity, right? In space, you also have a point of origin. But then you can actually move in any direction from that point of origin as far, uh, you know, uh, that we can imagine, you know, the, the four directions are north, south, west, east, that is something very natural that comes to us. So if we start to exploit these directions in space in, in doing statistics, that is what, uh, you know, that's the toolkit that spatial statistics will bring uh, to the table. Okay. So let's begin with some popular applications, all right? So, you know, uh, because we have to sort of combine concepts with applications in that spirit, you know, let's, let's see who cares about spatial statistics. So some of the most recent popular applications of spatial statistics have been, uh, you know, it has been a project by Facebook on expansion of internet coverage in Africa. Now, internet connectivity would be, can be provided using different modes, you know, it can be provided using landlines, using satellite signals, using drones or even hot air balloons. However, which mode is best suited for which region depends on the demand for internet, which will come from the population density of that particular region. So if we are going to remote regions, let's say of Africa or even in India, where we, we do not really have a sense of population density, uh, then what do we do? Well, then we can use satellites and, and data that comes from satellites to predict population density, uh, uh, you know, uh, of a region which may not be otherwise known and hence we cannot, you know, get internet to that particular population or that community at the best, you know, in the most optimal manner. So Facebook employed uh, satellite imagery and data science to predict population density for a large landmass of approximately the size of Africa. So it was a large scale application done using satellite imagery. And here is, you know, a, uh, you know, a particular uh, uh, data product that has come from this, this, this project of Facebook. Well, what you see is that on, on the northeast side of this, uh, you know, of this, uh, picture or this map, what you see is a high resolution data that, you know, Facebook predicted using satellite imagery. And on the south, you have a low resolution data set that comes from administrative surveys. What you see is that in the, in the, in the bottom picture, you have a sense of population density in the sense the lighter regions are low population density areas, the darker regions, the bright red regions are high population density areas. But in the bottom picture, you know, a particular district can have a uniform level of, uh, you know, population density, 
right? So if you have a white block or a white cell, it is saying that the population density is of certain level for this entire, entire block, right? Whereas if you go to this north map, um, this map in the north, you can have difference in the level of population density in that, in a block of similar size, okay? So you can have a, you can have lower density areas adjoining higher population density areas. So you have a higher resolution, higher resolution understanding of the region by itself. So this is powerful in the sense that, you know, it gives you a more sort of finer understanding of what's happening on the ground so that you can then allocate resources efficiently. Let's look at another example. So in, the, in another popular example of supply chain management, which is a more of a business intelligence uh, domain example, satellite data were used to estimate the number of vehicles parked or density of parking area utilized for 100 Walmart stores across the United States. And then these were then correlated with those, with the revenue streams and the sales of those stores. So what you see in this picture is that you can, you are looking at a, a satellite imagery which has a parking lot. It has a parking lot and you know, some portion of that lot has cars in it, right? So you can, you can first of all see through naked eye that you know some of some some portion has cars some portion has no cars right the other thing that you can see is that you can you can imagine that one can use software to actually count the number of vehicles that are parked in this parking lot so you can tell at a given point of time how many vehicles are being are parked in this parking lot which gives you a signal of how how many customers how many consumers might be visiting that walmart store this Walmart store at that given point of time. And that should then give you a signal of how, what should be the uh, level of sales or level of you know, uh, earnings that this store may be uh, you know, experiencing. So satellite data are, uh, can be used in such a way for business intelligence uh, you know, uh, 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 um, purposes. There are some other, you know, uh, some other, uh, some other uh, popular uh, examples and and I have a hyperlink here so if students are you know interested if you are interested please click on the hyperlink go and read there are more examples for example there's the Amazon's famous inventory optimization problem that that you'll find very interesting to read then there is prediction of crop yields for agricultural sector this has become a very famous uh, very popular tool in the West uh, which has larger farms for countries like India or low income countries, you know, prediction of crop yields is more challenging because we have smaller farms. So this is a problem, uh, you know, that is being explored by the research community at the moment. And then finally, you know, as we have also remarked earlier, there is optimization of drilling search for oil discovery that is done in the petroleum industry. A uh, recent, uh, you know, use of satellite imagery has, uh, has been found in the Economic Survey of India 2021-2022. Uh, this is probably the first time a government entity is, you know, uh, is evaluating, uh, you know, development or tracking development, as they say, using satellite imagery and maps. So let's see what we find in the Economic Survey of India 2021-2022. So what you see here is nighttime luminosity on the map of India uh, across space in 2012 and on the left and 2021 on the right. So on the left, you know, first of all, wherever you see a brighter light, that basically means that there is, there is, uh, there is, let's say, you know, there is more incidence of, of, of lighting. You know, it could be city lights, it could be residential lights, it could be street lights, whatever that is, all of that is aggregating and, as, and, and if we click a picture from space, you know, it looks like how, it tells us how light is, uh, you know, spread at, a, at nighttime in these cities. So you see New Delhi, uh, of course, around New Delhi, you have a, you have a, uh, you know, very large mass of light in 2012. So you have around Kolkata and similarly around Mumbai, right? So there are, these are metro cities. Of course, you will also see this in, around Bangalore, around Chennai. I'm, I'm only talking about these, right? So first of all, you know, the spatial information is, is rich enough to tell you the density of 
the difference, the variation in density of night lights in across different cities and, and different towns in India. If you come from a smaller town, maybe you can locate that in this map approximately and tell how much night light uh, was there in 2012 at that time. On the right hand side, when we move to 2021, uh, what is very clear is that the nighttime luminosity has on average increased in India, right? So if I were to look at a uh, non-spatial statistic, I will have a nighttime luminosity index for 2012 and a nighttime luminosity index for 2021. And of course, 2021 index will be much higher uh, than maybe even double than 2012 measure, right? So that's one type of statistical analysis or statistical understanding of, uh, you know, data-driven understanding of uh, nighttime luminosity in India. But you can do better. You can tell that the increase in nighttime luminosity has happened around the already existing cores in 2012. So luminosity has increased, but it has increased mainly around, you know, New Delhi, Mumbai and Kolkata. Right. What has also happened is that the area that looks quite dark, which is the Bihar, Jharkhand, West Bengal, and let's say Eastern UP, Uttar Pradesh, that is Eastern Uttar Pradesh, which looks pretty dark around the 2012 period, seems quite bright. So this is where the increase, the net increase is going to be coming from a lot. Right? So spatial statistics is powerful in the sense of not only telling us what has happened, how much it has happened, but it is also telling us where has it happened really. Okay? So if I were to tell you, okay, the night light luminosity was X1 in 2012, it was X2 in 2021, and it X2 was quite large as compared to X, X1. But then where has this increase come from? Well, it has come from the core of already existing uh, you know, high luminosity density around the metro cities, metropolitan cities of India. But it is also coming from the heartlands, the, the not so developed regions that are, that is Bihar, uh, West Bengal, Charkhand, and Eastern Uttar Pradesh, right? So this is, this is the interesting dimension that spatial uh, analysis brings to the table. The next, you know, uh, 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 you know, graph or the map that, that Economic Survey of India posits is the spread of commercial bank branches in India. So you can first, you can at the outset, you can see the kind of, you know, uh, uh, applications uh, that we are seeing as the first two examples in Economic Survey of India are very different. One is the nightlight luminosity, the other is bank branches. In this graph, in the left graph, we have the 2011, uh, you know, spread of commercial bank branches. Every dot by itself is a bank branch. Every dot on this map is a bank branch. So if you see higher density of dots, what you are basically saying is there is higher density of bank branches in that area. So there's higher activity of economic, you know, uh, transactions, you know, uh, uh, the credit industry might be more, uh, you know, dynamic in that, in that region, right? So now, you know, uh, uh, on, from 2011, then we have a commercial bank branches uh, spread in 2021. At the, at the outset, what we are seeing is, well, there are definitely more bank branches in India in the, uh, that, uh, from 2011 to 2021, right? And the number of bank branches, which is also coming from the economic survey, has gone up for, from 74,130 to 1,22,976. So there is indeed, you know, a, a, a pretty high increase, about a 70% increase if, uh, you know, uh, if, if, if not double, you know, about 80% increase maybe in, uh, you know, uh, in the increase of bank branches. That's one way to understand the world around us, right? So how and how much, by how much and what? So what has happened? Well, the number of bank branches has gone up. By how much? Well, by about 80, 70 to 80%, right? But where has it come from? Well, it is quite clearly coming from the region in Orissa and Chhattisgarh, where you do not see, you have this white map, a whitish map, which basically says there is less density of dots in this region, and which, which goes up quite drastically, at least in the coastal regions of, of Orissa, right? So, so this is uh, another very good example. Then we have another example on net zone area 
in India. Uh, here you can see again, you can have a statistics, a statistic of what has happened, net zone area has gone up. Um, by how much you can calculate, but where has it gone up in the most? Well, you can see here that Jharkhand seems to have a quite drastic increase in net zone area relative to other uh, states, right? You also see some of that in the southern states uh, that I've marked here. So this is the type of extra information that spatial analysis is bringing to the table. Of course, if net zone area is going up, another there is also a downside to it that you can see shrinking of water resources. So here, uh, you know, we have an annual cycle of water storage at Stanley Reservoir in Tamil Nadu. And we're looking at 2016 to 17. So June of 2016, uh, going up to May of 2017. So June of 2016 is just, uh, you know, right about at the onset of monsoons. Uh, so we are looking at the size of the reservoir. It goes up as the monsoons, you know, uh, play their role, you know, the rains happen. And in October, you have a larger size of water, uh, you know, capacity in this, uh, in this reservoir, or water storage in this reservoir. And then just before the onset of monsoons, you know, in May, you see that the reservoir actually shrinks and the shrinkage from October 2016 to May 2017 would have happened due to, let's say, irrigation or other types of demands of water, right? So this is a, another application of, of spatial data or data where we can find information which is delineated by space, right? Which is, let's say, spatially delineated. Uh, we can find applications in natural resource development, right? So if there is supposed, if we are supposed to manage water resources, probably we should look between post monsoon and right before monsoon period and try and conserve water the most because we see a lot of shrinkage during this period, right? Um, similarly, you have these, these urban development, uh, you know, uh, 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 pictures on the left, you have a uh, golf course road in Gurugram in 2005 uh, to 2021. You see the extent of development that has come about in 16 years period of time. You know, urban development, of course, it has urbanized, but it has not urbanized everywhere. If you look at the south west region, that seems to have driven most of the urbanization, whereas the northeast region seems to remain, a lot of it remains, seems to remain green, right? So this is urban planning. I mean, it, this, is, this is supposed to be local, you know, uh, 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 you know local administration, uh, opening up land or allowing development or not, or it could even be driven by the geographical features of the area, right? Uh, there is a similar understanding which, which students can spend uh, 30 seconds uh, by looking at development in the Bandra Kulla area in Mumbai uh, from 2001 to 2021, and, 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 and see where, and, and try and identify where, the where component of urban development in the sense, you know, has it happened? You know, where has it really happened? What are the areas it has not happened at? Does it do any, uh, does it make any impact on, uh, you know, on the, on, the, on the water resource that we see there? Uh, you know, about uh, it does, what kind of impact would it make on the greenery, the green, uh, you know, uh, coverage of the area um, and so on and so forth, okay? So, so um, you can definitely uh, try and identify these things on this picture on the right for Bandra Kulla, Mumbai. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, you know, uh, we will look at couple more examples, uh, you know, in this lecture. So the next example is, uh, you know, the evolution of population density across uh, Delhi. So what you see is from 2001 to 2021, the first thing you can see is we have more red blocks in the 2021 map for the NCR uh, region, that is national capital region in Delhi. Uh, than we had in, uh, in uh, you know, 2001. Uh, so we can say at the outset, the population density of Delhi and Sihar has clearly increased from 2001 to 2021. But then we can go one step further, like we have seen in previous examples, that, that we can identify what are, the what are the regions where this has really happened. So clearly, we have the region of Shahadra, which has seen a large increase in, or the, or the dominant increase in, in population density among different regions of Delhi. We have also seen this in the, in the Rohini region and, and, and uh, you know, we also observe that we don't see much of an increase or let's say 
not that much increase in the southeast Delhi region of, of uh, you know, south as De southeast Delhi region. The last sort of interesting example I want to talk about is the air pollution monitoring problem of Delhi. Of course, you know, Delhi suffers from a uh, from a air pollution crisis really. And, uh, you know, different agencies, different administrative agencies uh, have been trying to tackle this problem. How do they tackle this problem? Well, uh, you know, the first step is monitoring air pollution. You know, till we know what kind, how much problem, till, till we can measure the problem that we are facing, how are we supposed to, you know, address it? So, we have these air pollution monitoring stations, which are these green dots on the tape on, on, your, on, your, on your screen, which, which are spread across Delhi. Now, of course, you know, these provide you uh, the air pollution levels uh, in Delhi at every, you know, in, 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 at very high temporal frequency in the sense that you can go and, and, and measure air pollution levels every 30 minutes or even, or even with lower frequency. Uh, you know, in, at, in these regions. So you may see that some regions are experiencing higher pollution levels than others. For example, you know, East Delhi tends to have higher pollution levels than, let's say, uh, you know, uh, uh, some other regions that is around, let's say, the airport region, the Southeast, South uh, Delhi region, and so on. But there is an environmental justice, there is a very interesting environmental justice problem arises here, is that, you know, having these monitoring stations is costly, so we can't have them everywhere. But if the regions that we don't have these monitoring stations at, all these gaps, we don't really know what is the exact level of air pollution. Now the question arises, do the residents of New Delhi, where there is, uh, where the density of air pollution monitoring stations is low, do they not deserve to know the air quality that they, they are breathing, right? Now this is this sort of uh, you know uh, uh, sets off a problem that you know you can't have stations everywhere, but if you don't have them everywhere, you are actually sort of uh, leaving the residents uh, you know outside the opportunity of knowing the, the the kind of air quality that they that they are breathing, right? To solve this problem, you know spatial statistics provides provides this uh, tool called spatial prediction, in the sense that you know you can predict. Uh, the, the level of air pollution at locations where you may not be directly observing air pollution, uh, you know, levels during any given day or any given time, right? So it's a very interesting sort of, it's op it opens up a very interesting, you know, dimension of spatial statistics or something that it brings to table, uh, which can resolve issues that are very critical, uh, like environmental justice. Thank you. Mm -hmm.